Folks, thanks for coming out tonight. I know downtown is a mess tonight and it's been quite a challenge. So we appreciate it. Um, this is the seventh in our carceral country series. Um, the United States incarcerates more people than per capita than any other country in the world. And we wanted to kind of build a series around why that might happen and have a conversation about some of the issues that, that contribute to that. So um, our next event comes up in, is online on uh, November 9th. And we'll be talking with um, Reese Jones, who's written, Nobody is Protected, How the Border Patrol Became the Most Dangerous Police Force in the U.S. And Jen Budd, who's a former Border Patrol agent and author of Against the Wall, My Journey from Border Patrol Agent to Immigration Rights Activist. Mm -hmm. And they'll be in conversation about Border Patrol and what the Border Patrol means in the carceral immigration system, but also for everyone else in the world because they don't define, they don't keep themselves in one little box. Um, so they'll be talking about that and that will be online. You can see um, video of some of the previous conversations online. If you go to our website, there's a carceral country tab and you can see other things we've had. Um, an event with death row inmates here that called in, North Carolina death row inmates that called in to talk to us around a book that we published called Inside Voices from Death Row and, um, and a bunch of other programs as well. So ask you to check those out if you are interested. And we're happy to have Rebecca Todd Peters here, who's a professor of religious studies at Elon. Her books include Trust Women, In Search of the Good Life, and Solidarity Ethics. We have Trust Women on sale up at the front, and I'm sure Rebecca would be happy to sign one for you. Um, she's ordained in the Presbyterian Church and has been, an active, been active denominationally and ecumenically for more than 25 years. She currently represents the church as a member of the Faith and Order Standing Commission of the World Council of Churches. And Jacqueline Maffatore received her BA from Wake Forest and her Doctor of Law from Elon. She's a staff attorney with the North Carolina ACLU. So please welcome Jacqueline. And, yeah. and thanks to you all for coming out. We're, we're a great small group, so we can just have a conversation. So um, Jacqueline and I have prepared some um, information and material to talk through the history from Roe through Dobbs. Um, both talking about the legal side and talking about sort of the church and the culture and how those two things have been going hand in hand in shaping the conversation um, and ultimately um, the law in our country. So, um, you know, the, this is a really nice fit with this series around incarceration given the fact that we are really looking at um, the criminalization of uh, abortion um, the, and, you know, potentially um, most at risk are uh, providers, physicians, people who are providing um, abortion care. Um, but there are states that are talking about and legislators who are talking about actually incarcerating women for having abortion. So um, very definitely a concern. We just want to start with some basics just so you know. Um, there are about six million women who get pregnant every year in the U.S. Um, and when I first started doing this research, I was just stunned that almost half of all the pregnancies in the country are not planned, they're unexpected. Now that doesn't mean they're unwanted. Um, about 60% of those become uh, wanted pregnancies and about 42% well, end up um, uh, uh, terminated. Uh, but that's about uh, almost 3 million unplanned pregnancies every year. That is a lot, a lot, a lot of people. It's as many people as live in the city of Chicago. Um, and uh, one of the things I think is just really important for us all to recognize is how normal abortion is as part of women's access to their um, uh, just taking care of their bodies and their lives and, and their reproductive um, capacities. Um, so 42% of unplanned pregnancies are terminated, 19% of, um, of all pregnancies end in abortion, and about a quarter of women will have an abortion by the time they're 45. So it's also really helpful to recognize that that 42% rate 
that stays constant as the pregnancy rate goes down. So when you see that the abortion rate has gone down, it's because the unintended pregnancy rate has also gone down. Um, and so we could talk about that, you know, long acting reversible contraceptions have been a huge part of that. Um, but we'll also see in a little bit that that has meant that abortion has increased, the, the rate of abortion has increased among women in poverty. Um, so we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's also really important to recognize that most women spend about 2.7 years either trying to get pregnant, being pregnant, or just having been pregnant and nursing, um, you know, so that's not really that long. Most women have two kids, but they spend more than 30 years trying to avoid pregnancy because most women are fertile for between average 35 years. Um, and we know that at least, uh, you know, almost all women at some point in their lives um, use some form of contraception, so 99%. Um, and we also know that 62% of all of the people having abortions are religiously identified. Um, and that uh, is represented at the same rate that people are represented in the population. So there's about 30% of Protestants in the country, there are about 24% Catholics in the country, and so on. We also know that when we look at polling data, that it's, it's really, let's see if I can use my little pointer here, it's really e white evangelical Protestants who are against abortion. White mainline Protestants, 55% support abortion rights access, 60% um, of black Protestants, 52% uh, of Catholics. Um, so it's really a minority group of people who are pushing this agenda. Um, here's another statistic that, that, or a poll. This shows you the folks who support complete bans on abortion, um, which again, is a very minority position um, led again by white evangelical Protestants at 28%. Now followed by Hispanic Catholics. When you disaggregate Catholics, you will see that more Hispanic Catholics are um, against abortion than sort of the general Catholic population. But you'll also see that white mainline Protestants are the smallest group down here at 5%. And when you look at minority religious traditions, now Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Unitarians, all of those groups are about 1% or less of the population, but they're all very, very clear. Um, we could talk about different beliefs, religious beliefs about abortion, but all of them are majority supportive of legal access to abortion care. So why is it that in our country, Christianity is associated as an anti-abortion religion um, and anti-abortion positions are associated with Christianity? So that's really what I want to talk about um, and lay the groundwork for. Um, it's what I talk about and deconstruct the, this argument in my book. but. Um, you know, there, there's some sort of background pieces here. The current debate about abortion is, is terribly stigmatizing and harmful to women and families. Uh, and Christian forces are the linchpin at that debate. It's really Christian arguments, Christian people, Christian leaders um, who are promoting that idea in the country. Um, and one of the things that, it's great that, that we're in dialogue around the legal issues here um, because it's really important also to remember the ways in which um, we're really focused on the legal question, but it's really, that isn't independent of the cultural attitude and conversation um, that is then allowed for this to move um, into uh, the Dobbs decision over, I mean, that didn't just happen overnight, which we're going to trace here, it happened over a 40, 45 year period. Um, and so, so really, my argument overall is that we need to shift the narrative in the country, we need to shift how we talk about abortion in the country, um, because that cultural attitude is really going to then be reflected in our legal um, decisions. So the, the nice, this, this shows, the top line is um, folks who say, and that's, that's been the majority throughout, uh, you know, since Gallup started doing this in, in, in the 70s. Um, that sense of whether abortion should be legal always, sometimes, or never, right? And so most people really are in the sometimes camp. And that's the place that I want us to really hone in on and think about why. Why is that sometimes? And the, the, the language is usually certain circumstances. It's very coded language. Um, but you see that the dotted line is, that's the people who want to ban abortions. It's always been the most uh, minority position. The green line is people who want it to just be no laws, period. Um, this is since Dobbs, right? So we had a, 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 a dip here um, and a spike here, um, which is also interesting to see if that, if we stick, if, if those attitudes continue. But I call this 
this framework, this paradigm that shapes how we talk about abortion in the country, the justification paradigm, meaning women have to justify their decisions. They have to justify their abortions. And the, that justification is framed as what I call the prim reason. So that's pre, prenatal health, rape, incest, and a mother's life and health, right? So the prim reasons. Those are the four certain circumstances that people will say, well, under those circumstances, it's okay. Now, despite the fact that the same thing physically is happening in the clinic, regardless of what the circumstance is, but there is this moral veneer over our conversation that is rooted in prim reasons. And we know that historically there has been strong majority access or, or, or approval of um, access to abortion care for these reasons. Um, and that's, that's longitudinal data too that really hasn't shifted over decades. Um, although there are now evangelicals who are arguing that we should cut some of even these reasons, these justifiable reasons out of the access frame. But what it does, these prim reasons, they really, you know, just, they, they, they're a moral sword that divide abortions into the, the tragic, you know, if you're a prim, you're a tragic circumstance, or the damned. Um, those people who should be judged and shamed um, and, and potentially locked up for their decisions. So this paradigm, you know, it also, it, 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 uh, uh, a lot of things wrong with it we could talk about. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a couple. One is that it creates false binaries. One of them is the pro-choice, pro-life binary. The binary is interesting because the pro-choice one is talking, it's a legal question. Women should have access, legal access. The pro-life issue is a moral question and a moral issue. This is where we stand on how we think about the morality of this. So you have one group talking about legal questions, one group talking about moral questions, and they just go on like this. They're not really even having any kind of framework or platform for um, dialogue. So it's also really important to recognize, especially in the context of a culture that thinks Christianity is against abortion, that in the 60s, and the early 70s, almost all of the Christian denominations were supportive of the legalization of abortion, including the Southern Baptists, including the Mormons, um, including people that you, I think even the Jehovah's Witness, I mean, there were, they were making statements saying, in recognition of the cultural context of the 60s and 70s and the danger that women were facing, that people should have legal access to this health care. So the clergy consultation service was, was started in 1967. It was rabbis and clergy who helped people have access to care um, when they were not in states where they could get care. Um, the Presbyterian Church, this was before they reunited. Um, this is the, the Northern Church and that's the Southern Church. I won't read them, but, but there, this is also just symbolic of all of the mainline churches. All of them had similar kinds of statements saying, we think abortion should be legal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in this context then that we have Roe versus Wade come before the Supreme Court. And so I think it's important to remember that what brought the abortion issue before the Supreme Court was a Texas statute that criminalized abortion, made abortion a crime, um, made it a crime to procure abortion unless it was for the purpose of saving the life of the mother. At any stage of pregnancy, abortion was only legal in Texas for the purpose of saving the life of the mother, the health of the mother. Um, and it's in that context that the abortion question comes before the Supreme Court. Um, and you know, despite the pro-life perspective that Tati just set out um, regarding the, the, the moral, philosophical questions around when life begins, um, the Supreme Court said that that's that's not our business. Um, they said we we don't need to resolve that difficult question. Um, the law is not here to assign um, the right phil philosophy or um, moral code. The law is here to define what liberty means um, under the Constitution. That's the role of the courts, and we're going to completely stay out of that fray. The court acknowledge those competing arguments headlong. There was briefing before the court that made the, made the argument um, that life begins at con conception and therefore abortion was some kind of moral ill. And what the court instead focused on uh, were those women who were in danger, those women who um, sought more seeking 
um, bodily autonomy, um, equality of rights, um, and whether or not for them abortion access um, constituted a liberty interest that was protected under the Constitution. So the court looked to um, what's a doctrine that we call substantive due process, super wonky, but basically what that means is the court has historically looked to um, the 14th Amendment's due process clause and other aspects of the Constitution to define liberty because the Constitution does not otherwise define liberty. And it looked to cases um, that have essentially said that we have a fundamental right to choose how we parent our children. We have a fundamental right to choose um, to use contraceptive, contraceptives to, to decide whether we even want to have children, um, to our own intimate, private sexual encounters. All of those privacy rights um, are, are a facet of liberty under our Constitution. And the court looked at that line of precedent to say, um, that the liberty and privacy right also encompasses a person's decision um, whether or not to terminate their pregnancy. Um, so the right to choose is fundamental, is what the court concluded in Roe. The court recognized that the state does have an interest in protecting maternal life, and that the state could have an interest in potential life, the life of, of, of a fetus or a prenate. Um, but the court said that the mother's right was paramount. So they laid out a trimester framework. They said those rights, the, the, those interests, the maternal health and the potential life, sure, those could be compelling interests, but at what stage do those compelling interests mean more than the woman's right to her own body, bodily autonomy and her own right to choose? And what they laid out in Roe was a trimester framework. And they said that in the first trimester, when it's safer for a woman to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term, the state cannot regulate. It is a decision between a woman and her provider, um, and all restrictions on abortion are presumed con unconstitutional at this at this stage. Um, and under Roe, strict scrutiny applied to law seeking to regulate abortion, which is the highest tier of scrutiny you can ask for. Second trimester, a state can only regulate abortion for the preservation and protection of maternal health. That's the only the only type of regulation considered compelling during the second trimester. And then the court in Roe said that the third trimester or viability, remember this was the 70s, viability wasn't, medicine wasn't what it is today, and viability was closer to the end of a third trimester, which is around 26, 27 weeks, than what it's considered today, which is around 24. Um, the state can regulate or even outlaw abortion to promote the, the interest in potential human life. And their reasoning behind that was, at that point, a uh, prenate is viable, could exist as a separate person, and so only at that point could the state have a compelling interest in protecting that potentially separate person's rights. So, um, after Roe gets decided, um, it, it was uh, sort of a wake-up call for Catholics and evangelicals um, who I think many of them were surprised by this. Um, but even more so uh, than, than some of those folks who were surprised, I mean, the Catholics had been working against it in, at the state level in New York and New Jersey and in California and other places. But, um, there was a real mobilization of evangelicals, um, the moral majority. Um, there's documented evidence that um, Randall Balmer has written a really good book about um, the ways in which evangelicals decided they could use abortion um, as, a, as a wedge issue in political, um, uh, to, to serve political ends, um, and, and that it was a way for them um, to sort of uh, uh, motivate um, rank and file evangelicals um, to become politically active, and that's exactly what they did. Um, you know, and it, and it it has become particularly in the South. It just permeates culture. Um, but it's also really important to to look at the data related to this as well as sort of the history and the story. You know, and it, it's very clear that on each of these categories from the 70s into the mid um, 2010s, um, that, that it was a, a very much of a political shift on each of these, right? So, um, uh, 
it was not uncommon to find pro-life Democrats or pro-choice Republicans um, in the 70s, in the 80s, and even into the 90s. Um, and it was as those organizations began to, um, those as those sort of evangelical um, and some Catholic organizations, or wasn't really, I mean, the Catholic hierarchy is an organization, but the evangelicals had um, parachurch organizations um, that were moving the needle on the issue and the question uh, culturally. Um, and then that began to make traction at um, conventions, right? So then the Republican platform gets changed and the Democratic platform gets changed and then it becomes more and more of a political issue um, and then becomes a litmus test within um, political uh, candidates. So abortion has been weaponized as well um, and uh, the ways in which um, uh, people have not only moved into protest, but but literally weaponized in killing people, in attacking clinics, in um, creating violence um, that was more pronounced in the 80s and the 90s, um, uh, but certainly hasn't stopped. There are regular bomb threats at clinics um, on an ongoing basis across the country. So um, through the 90s in particular, um, most of the mainline Christian denominations had um, uh, actions that were taken at their national level where pro-life people in the Methodist, the, the uh, Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, the um, Episcopal Church, um, you know, the, UC, the UCC to some extent, um, they weren't as successful with the UCC, but, but there were pro-life groups within each of those denominations that kept sending up um, uh, you know, statements for the national church to pass. And that was part of what eroded some of the um, uh, support, some of the very strong support that happened in the 70s in Christian denominations, but it was also really only talked about at that very, very high level. Um, and uh, and we'll talk more about, about what happened after Speaking, speaking of erosion, <laughs> um, so in the early 90s, in the climate of all of that politicization of the abortion issue, of the you know extremely vocal minority um, making this a wedge issue, we had states like Pennsylvania um, that got bold and wanted to see how far they could push their ability to regulate what is in certain political bases becoming a, the, a very unpopular issue, um, abortion. And so uh, Pennsylvania enacted a series of laws that were all arguably plainly unconstitutional under Roe. Um, does that sound familiar to this <laughs> recent history? So Pennsylvania enacted um, what they called an informed consent requirement, what we here in North Carolina like to call um, a biased counseling requirement, uh, a 24-hour ban. So a woman had to hear this biased counseling um, and then wait 24 hours before she could receive her abortion. Um, a requirement for parental consent for minors to receive an abortion, um, reporting requirements for clinics, and a spousal consent requirement for married women seeking abortions. And all of those got taken up to the Supreme Court under, under Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And so the court in Casey did ultimately, in the wake of all of this political turmoil and um, all of these moral positions and religious positions um, coming to the fore uphold the central decision in Roe under the principle of stare decisis. What the heck is stare decisis? So, in order to maintain the rule of law, to maintain its own legitimacy, the Supreme Court will typically follow its previous decisions when it is ruling on a, a similar decision. Um, and that's so that we can all in, like trust that the law is stable and understand what the law is going to be, right? And it theoretically affords the Supreme Court legitimacy. But in certain circumstances, the Supreme Court will overturn a rule um, if it's like plainly, plainly wrong. Like for example, like Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, or if it undertakes an analysis and looks at certain factors, it concludes the decision should be overturned. And so those, those factors are the quality of the reasoning of the decision, the workability of the rule that it set forth, reliance on the rule, and whether if they overturned that rule, 
the reliance interest would cause a hardship um, or inequity if the rule was overturned, um, new developments in the law, and changes in factual circumstances. And so in Casey, the court looked at all of these things. Um, they rehashed the history that was um, trekked through in row, determining that, you know, in the majority of American history, um, there, it was not criminal to have an abortion prior to quickening, which we now relate to viability. Um, and they looked at the, fact, the factual circumstances and concluded that those were basically the same as they were when Roe was decided, with very few exceptions. Um, and most importantly, in my opinion, they looked at reliance. Um, and they, they spoke about the extent to which people rely on the ability to control whether and when they have children in order to fully participate in our society on equal footing. And they concluded that abortion, um, pre-viability abortion, remains a fundamental right in our country. And they, again, allegedly stayed out of that fray, really, you know, the fray regarding when life begins, um, whether or not uh, a fetus is a human life, um, and, you know, said some really strong stuff. A quote that we, we love and we still quote today, even though the decision is dead, that at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own, one's own pop concept of existence, of meaning of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood were they formed under compulsion of the state. So it is not the role of the court to mandate a moral code. That is what Casey said. So why am I saying that it eroded the right? <laughs> because in what Casey also said is that the state's interest in protecting potential life is a legitimate interest from the very moment a woman becomes pregnant. That while a woman has a right to choose to terminate or continue her pregnancy before viability, it does not at all follow that the state is prohibited from taking steps to ensure that this choice is thoughtful and informed they may enact rules and regulations designed to encourage her to know that there are philosophical and social arguments of great weight that can be brought to bear in favor of continuing the pregnancy. And that is a, an interest that the state has from moment one. So what did that mean then for the abortion right? It meant that Casey eliminated that trimester framework and maintained only the viability line. So pre-viability, you have a fundamental right to abortion, post-viability, the state may regulate as long as it's rational. Made no distinction between the state's interest in maternal health and promoting potential life. So from the very moment someone is pregnant, they can regulate their ability to have an abortion on equal footing, whether the interest is maternal health or promoting potential life. And they adopted what we call the undue burden standard, which allows abortion regulations as long as they are not an undue burden on the ability to choose abortion. Remember, before I said these restrictions were subject to strict scrutiny. The highest level of legal scrutiny we have, um, the hardest for a, a, a lawmaker to overcome, you really have to have a compelling interest to overcome strict scrutiny. Undue burden is a made up test. They made it up for this case. It only applied to abortion from 1992 to 2022. Um, what is an undue burden? The definition is super cyclical. Basically, an undue burden is a burden that is undue. Um, courts, in trying to interpret this, have had a really hard time. They've come up with things called like this, the large fraction test, where if it causes an undue burden on a large fraction of, of women seeking access to abortion, then it's undue burden. And it's been really challenging to apply, and people have criticized its workability. And you might have remembered that I said workability earlier, and we're going to come back to that. Um, but what it also did was open the door to a bunch of regulations that would have been plainly unconstitutional under Roe. Um, and so it opened the door for people that, in influential positions, who maybe have the view that abortion is immoral, um, that, it, that a, a prenate is a human life, um, to actually have a material impact on legislation. So um, this is this is just continuing where I would pick where I picked up before or where I, where I left off before. Um.
they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it in church. They don't want to talk about it in public. They don't want to talk about it with their kids. They don't want to talk about it, uh, period. Um, and so it has created a cultural vacuum that has been filled by the evangelicals um, and the Catholics. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's always important whenever I talk to note that the Bible doesn't say anything at all about abortion, period, one way or the other. Um, abortion was certainly extant in the ancient Near East at the time that these texts were being written. People knew about abortion. People were getting abortions. There are other documents that we know um, that that's the case. Um, there are certainly lots and lots of things that the Bible said you shouldn't do, um, and it doesn't say anything about abortion. The, the only text that even comes close to thinking about sort of the moral status of the prenate is a text in Exodus where if two men are fighting and they accidentally hit a woman who's pregnant and she miscarries, then the penalty for the miscarriage is less than if she were to die, right? So it clearly shows that the dis there's a distinction made in that ancient Near East text between the quality or level of um, the prenate um, and the woman's life. But we do have um, a lot of cultural baggage that goes back to interpretations around the Garden of Eden, um, around um, Eve as the original mother of the living and the first uh, female human who um, supposedly, um, you know, sort of uh, disobeyed God by eating from the fruit of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and then uh, gave it to her husband who was there with her. Um, and this text has been interpreted through misogynist and patriarchal traditions um, in very negative ways that have created um, very um, uh, gendered particular uh, expectations about what women's role is, what their purpose is. You know, if you even think about the idea of menstruation being called the curse, right? That goes back to the garden, right? Eve was cursed with menstruation, which doesn't happen. That's not what the text says. But all of these things, it, it's all about interpretation. Um, and so a lot of what I've been doing um, in the last number of years is, is, is being part of um, feminist theological communities who are reinterpreting Eve and talking about the fact that Eve chose to be the first person who was able to recognize good and evil. She is our moral mother. She's the one who brought to us the one thing that makes us most human in the world, the ability to make moral decisions and to know um, good, and, uh, good and evil. So this traditionalist, misogynist, patriarchal Christianity and justification creates really clear um, tropes in our society that all pregnancies are gifts from God, that prenates are full humans at the moment of conception, and that women are morally obligated to gestate when they're pregnant. That's women's purpose in life is to bear children. So time-limited question, they don't have very long, but we don't have any sort of, we have, we have so framed the conversation in the country that we're not creating any support for people asking that question, any resources, any help to help people navigate and think through um, how to answer that question. So this takes us up, you know, so after the Casey decision in 92, you opened that door um, that then Republican legislatures ran through in 2010 when they, um, so 2008 was the, the first Obama. This is the midterm after Obama where you had the, the huge backlash. You had Republican state houses across the country um, flipped. And, and this, is, this is the year right here. This is 2010. And this is when all of these regulations spiked. Um, and when they began passing these laws. Um, and so for the last 12 years, we've had these laws being passed across the country with the express intent, people were saying very explicitly, we want to make this the case that brings down Roe. Um, repeated in state houses across the country, that was what they were going for, that was their goal. So what, what did all of that mean for North Carolina specifically? Um, Um, so in North Carolina, that meant that post-1992 and really mostly post-2010, um, we got a whole swap of restrictions on abortion in the state of North Carolina that would have been patently unconstitutional under the trimester framework in Roe. Um, and so what, what that has ended up meaning is that 91% of North Carolina counties don't have an abortion provider. Um, 
a patient receiving an abortion in North Carolina has to get biased counseling. And North Carolina actually has one of the most stringent waiting periods in the country. We have a 72 hour waiting period. So pre 2010, we had a 24 hour waiting period. And then in 2013, we got a 72 hour waiting period. Um, you cannot use telehealth for medication abortion. So you have to go in person to receive a pill and take a pill in front of a doctor to have medication abortion when in other states you don't have to do that. There's no reason, medically speaking, to take the first pill in the presence of a doctor. And the first pill in medication abortion is not the one that causes grip. Um, and we have trap laws here in North Carolina that make it really hard to trap. So a trap law is a targeted restriction on abortion provider. Um, and usually what it, they are, there are these regulations that doctors have to comply with, that, that abortion facilities have to, like facilities providing abortions have to comply with, that are really difficult to comply with. They may, you, your hallways have to be a certain width. Um, you have to have a, a specific separate, um, like locker room changing area. You essentially, they, they're requiring abortion providers to be set up like an OR or an ambulatory surgery center, even if they only want to provide medication abortion. And what that means is that it's really difficult to have a clinic that can provide abortion. Um, and that has the greatest impact on rural communities, poor communities, and um, communities of color. And we are one of, the, one of six states that bans um, perfectly qualified professionals um, advanced practice clinicians um, from providing abortion, um, specifically um, medication abortion. Um, many of these practitioners are allowed to provide the exact same medication um, to help a woman go through a miscarriage, but they're not allowed to prescribe it in the instance of an abortion. Um, I'll just go back for one, oops, wrong way. Um, just for one second to, to also just point out the relationship between some of these things that those trap laws are part of why only 91 or, or, or only 9% of counties have access to an abortion provider prior to that physicians OBGYNs could have abortions in their offices right and so people had access in a way that when you say you can't do that because you have to be able to put two gurneys down a hallway then you're um, restricting access um, for the care that people should be able to get from their regular doctor, and they're not then able to do that. Okay, so again, going back, um, again, just sort of the, the theme around um, who is filling the public airways with messages about Christianity and abortion. Um, the pro-life uh, politicians have always been much more strident, much more articulate about um, not necessarily, it's not a complex position, but that they are pro-life, whereas the pro-choice politicians are often, you know, trying to vacillate and um, sort of have it both ways, right? So you get the, the, the awful Bill Clinton quote that it should be um, safe, legal, and rare, um, uh, which, which is a stigmatizing comment, right? It's a stigmatizing comment implying that um, it, there's something wrong with it and therefore it should be rare. climate that, that leads us to pretty much present day, um, the elimination of the, the right, fundamental right, um, through Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which just came down from the Supreme Court this past summer. Um, and whereas um, the, the court in Roe and the court in Casey both were very explicit um, that they, that moral theological positions um, should not come into the fray in the decision making um, and that a liberty uh, should allow for people to make those sorts of moralistic um, or religious decisions on their own and should not, should not in turn influence the law. Um, in Dobbs what we see is, is sort of a, a departure. Um, so in Dobbs we get, well individuals are certainly free to think and say what they wish about existence, meaning, and the universe, and the mystery of human life, they are, all, they are not always free to act in accordance with those thoughts. Licensed to act on the basis of such beliefs may correspond to one of the many understandings of liberty, but it is certainly not order liberty. So what 
happened in Dobbs. Um, the Dobbs majority used an originalist interpretation, and so originalism is a school of um, legal thought that essentially says that when interpreting a law or the Constitution, you should um, give the original meaning that the drafters of the documents would have assigned to it at the time of the drafting, and you should look back to the circumstances surrounding the time of the drafting in order to inform your decision. So, used an originalist interpretation, and also utilized stare decisis that we talked about before um, to determine that Roe was wrongly decided. Um, while the majority opinion did not cut down those other substantive due process rights that we talked about, the you know freedom to um, marry, the right to privacy in one's own uh, child rearing and familial or private sexual decisions, um, it left those intact um, by its text. The court stated that those liberty and privacy rights do not extend to an abortion. And the reason that the court said, um, despite the fact that obviously abortion um, is tied pretty intimately to one's decision on whether or not to have a child much in the same way as contraception, um, that the court said it was fundamentally different is because it deals with an unborn human being. Um, and so that was a bit of a departure as well from the language that the court had previously used to describe um, a, a fetus or a prenate um, and the interest that the state had um, in, in that fetus or prenate. Um, previously, we saw potential life, right? Um, the potential for life. Um, but in the Dobbs decision, the majority opinion very plainly states that the abortion issue is dealing with an unborn human being. Um, and, and I would go so far as to say it's a radical departure more than <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the shift to a theological argument that, 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 that what the status of, of so, this prenatal is. So, you know, this phrase in and of itself <laughs> could be considered um, a, a moral or a religious stance. Um, and so what that meant is that restrictions on abortion are constitutional if they have a rational basis. Rational basis review is the lowest level of screening in constitutional law. Um, as long as your um, restriction is rationally related to a legitimate state interest. That is all you need to show. Um, and you can come up with the, the justification after the fact under rational basis for you. It doesn't even actually need to be motivated at all. Um, and the court explicitly returned the decision on the regulation of abortion to the students. So, Let's talk just briefly about, again, about stare decisis. So in Casey, right, the court went through this exact same exercise only 20 years ago and decided that the principles of stare decisis meant that the fundamental right to abortion should remain intact. They should not overturn. Right. So, so what changed? Um, the dissent, as you'll see, will argue that nothing material to the decision has actually changed. But the court reevaluated the historical analysis that had been undertaken in Roe and Casey about the nature of the right and said it was wrong. Um, it looked to the undue burden standard, which the Casey court established in place of the trimester framework, and so many have criticized as unworkable as compared to the trimester framework, and said it's unworkable. What a surprise. Um, and the court looked to changes in factual circumstances in a way that to me also seems very much like a, a moral, uh, taking a moral position by looking at things like safe haven laws um, and the availability of safe haven laws um, in every state in the country to say, well, abortion is no longer as necessary because there are viable alternatives to abortion such as safe haven laws. Um, but <laughs> the, the idea that adoption is just like a one-for-one -one substitution for, for an abortion just overlooks so much. and makes so many presumptions um, about a, a person's ability to choose what's best for their life, um, but that, that is what happened. Um, and regarding reliance, they basically punted that to the states. They said, you know, we're not gonna, we don't think that it's the same kind of reliance interest that exists in other circumstances. You can prevent a pregnancy. Um, you know, a woman isn't always pregnant. <laughs> um, 
there, but nonetheless, we're going to kick that to the states. If states think that there's a reliance interest, they can legislate about it or find that in their own. Um, so that's where we ended up. Um, the, the majority in and of itself is really concerning, but something else that many have found deeply concerning um, is the concurrence by Justice um, Thomas. And so Justice Thomas has long, long taken the position, so this is not new, but reiterated um, in this position um, is a little scarier, that the Due Process Clause doesn't secure any substantive rights. It's a process. Um, it just secures a process. And so the Constitution doesn't, if the Constitution doesn't describe it as liberty, it's not a liberty. Um, and he explicitly stated that the Supreme Court should revisit the decisions that established a right to contraceptives, the right to privacy um, in your consensual sexual intimacy, um, and the right to same-sex marriage. Very explicitly called on the court to revisit those decisions. So this is the data that I was talking, referring to earlier. Um, we can see that uh, in the mid-80s, um, the uh, abortion um, rate was about 50% um, for women who were poor or near poor. I'm not sure why it's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's now up to 75%. So um, this is just a clear um, recognition of the fact that um, increasingly um, it's poor women who are um, having abortions um, and, and, and most, most scholars think that's due to the fact that women who, are, who have access to health care are having better access to long-acting reversible contraception, so their unplanned pregnancy rate is going down, um, whereas poor women don't have regular access to, they may have sporadic access to health care um, and uh, to um, uh, contraception. Um, and so it's those months in between um, when they're getting pregnant um, and uh, having those unplanned pregnancies. Um, it's also the case that women of color are overrepresented among abortion patients because women of color are overrepresented among people living in poverty. Um, so it goes back to sort of this historic racism um, and um, structural access to um, jobs, housing, um, education, all the sorts of things that help contribute to people having um, stable incomes. Um, and it's also important to recognize that still the majority, uh, the, or the, the, the largest group of people having abortions are still white women. So this is also, I think, really important for people to know and remember that almost 90% of abortions happen in the first 12 weeks prior to DOPS. That will change because women are not going to have access. They're going to have to travel. Many of them are going to have to get funds um, to be able to travel. Um, and so we're talking about beginning to push women much, much farther into pregnancies um, before they're able to have access to care. And my current research project right now is uh, the Abortion and Religion Project. I, I have a, a team with me, so I'm Protestant and white. I have a black Protestant colleague, a Jewish colleague, a Muslim colleague, and a Catholic colleague, and we're interviewing women having abortions right now across the country. And so the women that we're seeing who are having to travel, already we're seeing just in the last couple of months that they're much later in their pregnancies than the women that we interviewed for the last year. So. I just want to note that while abortion is very safe, even safer now than it was before, um, and, and in most cases safer than actually carrying a pregnancy to term, the longer that you're made to remain pregnant, the more potential risk that an abortion involves. So the longer you're made to carry an unwanted pregnancy, the more likely you are to encounter a risk um, by virtue of your abortion. So um, as I mentioned, it did not seem to the dissent like very much had changed at all between Roe and Casey um, and present day. And they were not shy about pointing that out. Uh, the dissent noted that the court reversed this course today for one reason and one reason only, because the composition of this court has changed. Um, and so we can really see, you know, despite the fact that, you know, throughout our nation's history, the Supreme Court has been like lauded as this apolitical entity like that is uh, unpersuaded by public opinion, um, that the court has changed along the same trajectory that 
much of this conversation has changed. And it, all it took was a personnel change um, in order to get there. Right? Um, but the Supreme Court also acknowledged more than just what has happened to the like integrity of the Supreme Court. Um, they, they were also very clear in acknowledging the, the implications, the ramifications of the court's decision. Right? Um, what the court's decision did here was enable states to criminalize abortion again. Um, across a vast array of circumstances, a state will be not have the right to vote, um, just fundamentally does not protect women. Um, but I do also want to note that there is, if you, if you want to find it, there is an originalist argument that um, the 14th Amendment at the time of its ratification was intended to protect or preserve bodily autonomy. It was enacted, um, you know, following the abolition of slavery in a time where enslaved people were not um, given the agency or autonomy to make their own decisions about having a family, whether or not to bear children. Um, and seeking to secure those rights was the origin of the 14th Amendment. So there is an argument for originalism um, to, if, if you want to find it. Unfortunately, that's not what the majority wanted to do with it originalist interpretation. Um, and in the wake of Dobbs, what have we seen? Um, so we still have all these restrictions that Casey allowed for, but um, pre-Dobbs, the we had a 20-week abortion ban in the state of North Carolina that was found to uh, violate the Constitution, and it was enjoined in 2019 by the court. Um, and since the Dobbs decision came out, the court that enjoined that 20-week ban has dissolved the injunction, which means we once again have a 20-week ban. So the estimate is that more than half of women risk losing access to abortion um, in, um, you can see the map, um, most of the South, um, much of the Midwest. Um, there are going to be pockets where uh, people have access. Um, it's interesting, North Carolina is listed as losing access, um, and that's going to depend on the election. Um, you know, if, if the state house goes Republican, we probably will. Um, and so uh, that's why this, this was one of the news outlets that, that saw that and, and so marked us as, as losing access um, under the expectation that we would go Republican. So make sure you vote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll clarify, we are, our state house is Republican right now. But it has to be oh, Sorry, the super, super majority. majority. Thank right. you. That's right. That's right. That we would lose the super majority. Or that we would, there would again be a super majority. Thank you. Um, and in two years, if we lose the governorship, the right, the ability to veto as well. So um, the frame, um, after I deconstruct the justification now, uh, framework in this book, I, I move into what should replace it. When I say we need to change the narrative in the country, what I'm arguing is that we should move into and learn from um, women of color who have developed the, ju the reproductive justice framework. Um, in 1994, a group of 12 black women were meeting at a Clinton Healthcare Reform Conference. And there were hundreds of people there, there were 12 of them. They sort of found each other. They holed up in a hotel room and started talking about what all of these white women are talking about is not applicable in our community. It's not helpful for or um, relevant to the experiences that black women are facing. This idea of choice is doesn't work. The, the choice implies that you can choose to or choose not to, and that's not the experience of women that we live and work with. Um, and that it completely ignores um, a host of other issues that are reproductive justice issues um, that are very deeply relevant to black women's lives um, uh, around access to contraception, around access to infertility treatment, around um, uh, ability to have care for, um, you know, oncological care for, for gyne gynecological um, cancers. Um, just, just a host of issues. Um, related to um, the lives of women in their community. So they developed the reproductive justice frame. They also said there's this sort of outsized attention to abortion. Abortion is a question that should be considered within this larger framework of, of all of these other issues. And so they started by saying that there are four principles. The first one is absolutely uh, 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 supportive of abortion, that women have the right not to have a child, that that is very important to start there. But again, given the history of black women in the country, they also have the right to have a child. 
So within the history of the black community, black women have both been forced to have children for other people and been sterilized and prevented from having children that they wanted to have. So their history is part of what led to these principles. Um, the third one is the right to parent in safe and healthy communities. And again, recognizing that reproductive justice doesn't end after babies are born, that there are many families and, and, and mothers and parents who are trying to raise their children um, in environments, in communities that are not safe, um, and that there needs to be more attention to making sure that all the communities across the country are safe and healthy. Um, and then the last one, there's there's debate about what the fourth one is. Some women that I hear talk about it as the right to sexual pleasure. Other women talk about it as the right to bodily autonomy. There's certainly overlap around um, bodily autonomy and sexual pleasure. Um, but but that sense um, of also making sure that, um, that, that women as women are seen in this framework. Um, so that it's not just about the ability to have children or to, to parent, that it's also about um, women. So what can we do? Um, we did want to just to touch on some of this. Um, again, stop letting the religious right define the debate, change the conversation in the country, you know, talk, learn more about the reproductive justice frame, begin to talk about um, that, stop using the language of the religious right. Um, I, Jacqueline is also using prenate, that's a word that I coined to talk about whatever the entity is inside a person's body, that it's a prenate, it's not a baby, it's not an unborn human being. Um, it's not yet, it's got potential, but we don't, it's not a human being yet. So we need a new narrative. Um, religious voices matter in this. Uh, started out talking about how Christian forces are the linchpin of the debate and how stigma about abortion is harmful um, and that we need new ways of talking. Um, fight abortion stigma. My kid brought some of the yard signs. If you'd like a yard sign, <laughs> um, we have yard signs. Um, uh, one says abortion access is a moral and social good. The other one said abortion bans are against my religion. Um, if you're a person of faith, talk about this from a faith perspective. There's also this binary that all the secular pro-choice people, or all the pro-choice people are secular, all the pro-life people are Christian, and there's just this vacuum again of that religious voice um, supporting abortion rights. Um, this is an organization that I'm on the board of, um, and if you are part of a religious community um, and would like to learn more about it, I'm happy to talk with you. We wrote a seven-week curriculum for people to study in their communities together. It's about, it's using a reproductive justice frame. It's talking about bodies and sexuality and healthy sexuality. Within that, then talking about what does it mean to bear children and to have a family and be a family and and what is the role of, um, or how do we think about abortion um, within the context of that. So um, we are hoping that more religious communities across the country will become sacred congregations. We'll put big signs in their front of their churches and synagogues that say, we support women's uh, right to uh, abortion access, et cetera. Um, and then you know, we have some, some final things to think about uh, what does this mean very practically as this has moved to the state level? So um, these are just some of the things that are possible. Repeal existing legend regulations, um, challenge existing laws in court, um, pass a state constitutional amendment, although maybe you could talk about that. That's sure. particularly difficult in North yeah. Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> so I, and challenge existing laws in court, you might be like, what do you mean? Um, you just spent time talking to us about how our right has been decimated by the courts. Um, so challenges to see laws in court, when, when we say that, you know, the Supreme Court, federal courts are not our only option here. That we, um, there has been a lot of very successful litigation challenging these laws in state courts based on state constitutions. And some of these restrictions are so arbitrary <laughs> that you could make an argument that they don't even meet that that base, that lowest level, that rational basis review level um, of review. So all is not lost in the courts. <laughs> we, um, I would say down to here, uh, pursuing a fundamental right to abortion, again, redux in state court, has seen success in places that you might not expect um, based on the fact that state constitutions can afford a greater privacy right, a greater equal protection right, um, maybe even a more like clearly defined and um, spe like specific privacy right than the federal constitution did. Um, for example, Kansas 
um, Kansas' mm -hmm. constitution was interpreted to protect the right to abortion. Um, and they defeated a state constitutional amendment that would have outlawed um, or would have explicitly stated that abortion is not a fundamental right under the Kansas Constitution. Why is that hard here in North Carolina? Um, in North Carolina, we do not have citizen-initiated referendum. Um, and so we don't have the ability to gather signatures to put something on the ballot in the state of North Carolina. In the state of North Carolina, something goes on um, the ballot to become a constitutional amendment. If two-thirds, two-thirds, three-fifths, something more than a simple majority of the legislature votes to have it added to the ballot, and then we get to vote on it. So while it's still changing the conversation, I would argue is critical to the success of any of these, um, it's, it's critical a little differently um, for a state constitutional amendment in the state of North Carolina than it might be in other places. Um, we've also seen states that have been passing laws um, to protect explicitly protect abortion access in their states so not not waiting for a court case to define what their state constitution means just laying out legislation that says in this state abortion is protected and that is the law um, but we've also seen states passing laws to protect physicians in their states for potential civil or criminal liability um, should they provide an abortion to somebody from a state that is currently trying to criminalize abortion. Um, so that is something else that we're seeing happen. And then, you know, it's early voting. Um, I don't know, have, has everybody who's eligible to vote voted? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, so just like moving forward, I would say vote with this issue in mind um, because everybody that has the ability to make decisions on all of these tactics. <laughs> um, the people that we are wanting to hear a change narrative are elected officials in the state of North Carolina. Um, so vote with these issues in mind. Here in North Carolina, even our courts are elected. Um, so literally, <laughs> the right at the state level comes down to people who a narrative shift can materially um, affect who ends up in and that's it. So now we can have we can have a conversation. A normal conversation. Yeah. So I've got two totally different questions. Mm -hmm. and I guess one is really for you. I think one is for you. So the one for Toddy is um, one of the reframings that has been floated. I don't know that it's gaining traction. Is um, reframing the so-called pro-life position as the forced birth position. Mm -hmm. And so I want I want you to weigh in on that narrative. Mm -hmm. But before I forget my second mm -hmm. one, I want to ask you, all, of all those possibilities of where possible change might go, right, might happen and possible avenues for increasing abortion rights, doesn't Moore versus North Carolina come up in the Supreme Court if that goes south as it seems likely to go in October, like all of that stuff, we have a ticking time bomb. We might have a year or so to make some inroads of that. But more versus North Carolina is sort of the, the game changer. So I'll let Toddy answer the first question okay. first. Um, I had not heard about that. It makes sense. Um, I think you know we all know that shifting how we think and talk, how we talk about things, shifts how we think about things. So I mean. Um, the death tax is like the perfect example of that. You took a, a tax that, you know, very few people would ever access and made all of America against it um, by calling it the death tax and framing it that way. So, you know, recognizing um, the power of language um, to shape how we think, I, I'm, I'm always supportive of thinking through you know sort of what that might do and I think you know the reality is it's a for, it is forced birth it is forced pregnancy I, I'm not sure I, I think I might go with forced pregnancy rather than forced birth but um, the idea of compulsory pregnancy of forcing people to bear children I mean I think there are all sorts of ways you could come up with language that could potentially help people see what's happening in a new way so what do you think about it? Where did you hear about it? 
Oh, I've heard it in several places. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I think it's a good move. Mm -hmm. I think the question, changing the uh, moral question to a legal question of under what circumstances does a state have the right to force a person to be mm -hmm. remain pregnant. Mm -hmm. And you could even elaborate more than that, under what circumstances does a state have the right to require a person to lend bodily goods to another to save their life, mm -hmm. right? I mean, those, because one of the problems, I think, with our moral conversation about abortion is that it is so, actually, you and I have argued a little bit about this, mm -hmm. is that our moral arguments assume this is a unique situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure it is unique. I think the pro-life arguments would also, even if you cop to a lot of their basic premises I disagree with, would also justify a state requiring people to become organ donors against their will. And donating a redundant organ is far less dangerous under the right medical conditions than a pregnancy, and absolutely would save a life that no one questions is a full-blown person. Mm -hmm. But we have a revulsion mm -hmm. against the notion that the state would require someone to go under the knife mm -hmm. for a really relatively safe procedure to save another being. Well, that could happen to a man. Right. That's so the bodily, yeah, right, yeah, that's the bodily what she's trying to shift it to do, right? so that but we people will not, see that. <laughs> right. We do not have a revulsion encroaching upon the bodily yeah. autonomy of women, and we also, and on top of that, have a revulsion to, according to women, the the decision to end the life, even if you want to cop to the life, which I think is different than a human person, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. we are very that is. That is revolting to us that women have that power, um, yeah. and not revolting when men have that wield that power regularly. Well, and there's just also this deep, 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 explicit expectation that women will bear children. Yeah. The, and and that so women saying they don't want to bear children is it, it, it's also hard to get past that. Really repugnant. But not all women, too. So there's a problem. I mean, yes, the women bear children, but I don't think you can, as you have argued, I don't think you can get beyond the racist element of it. No, sure, no. Some I mean, women are supposed to <laughs> bear children, and <laughs> some women are absolutely pathologized yeah. and criminalized yeah. for bearing yeah. children. So it depends what kind of woman you are. But we're still going to make her carry that pregnancy to term. We are. Yeah. Um, I don't want to cut the conversation short, but I do want to answer your question as well. So I don't think more versus Harper has much to do with the solutions that we just discussed. Um, because, and this was sort of intentional on my part, the, the solutions we just discussed are state-based. Um, and so more versus Harper does impact the political process, but the what what is impacted by the more versus Harper decision is Congress um, and, the, and the composition of Congress. And so um, the, the state legislature's argument in Moore versus Harper is essentially that the state court does not have the authority um, or the right to pass judgment on congressional district maps under the state constitution because the elections clause of the federal constitution assigns that duty to state legislatures. But that does not apply to state legislative districts. It only applies, that argument only applies to federal elections. Um, and state legislative elections are not federal elections, thank thankfully. Um, so I am the that, that the independent <laughs> of legislature theory is absolute malarkey. It is a fringe theory. That does not mean we're safe from it. We all know that. Um, but I have, you have to keep having hope in this work. So I have hope <laughs> that it won't take hold. If it does take hold, I do not think that it will have an impact on what we just discussed because those are state-based. Um, state-based potential solutions. And I can't believe I did not like uplift my own work <laughs> at all. But North, the North Carolina ACLU is currently challenging five of those restrictions that we talked about that were enacted following Casey um, as unconstitutional under the North Carolina Constitution. And that, law, that lawsuit is ongoing right now. Um, so we're arguing, so the lawsuit um, 
is seeking to invalidate the bias counseling requirement, the 72 hour waiting period. Um, North Carolina's trap laws, the APC ban, so the, the ban that says that nurse qualified nurse practitioners and um, physician assistants and nurse midwives cannot perform any abortion in the state of North Carolina. Um, and the telemedicine ban. We're challenging all five of those. And we have argued that none of them are rational, but we've also argued that the North Carolina Constitution should recognize a fundamental right to abortion, um, separate and apart from the federal constitution. So that, that's moving through the courts now, not as fast as we might like, um, but it is moving through the courts now. Um, the folks that will decide that case are all elected officials. So our chances might fundamentally shift here in just a little bit. Mm. Um, but again, those are all state-based. So thankfully, I don't think that horrible decision has, has the possibility of making this already horrible situation more horrible. Does it have the potential to like impact things like um, a federal, uh, federal statute protecting the right to abortion or the ability to take actions like enlarging the court or those kinds of things, yeah, it, it does. Um, but to the extent that Dobbs punted this issue back down to the states, I don't think it has an impact on that. Is there an argument from the, um, and I'm not a legal scholar or a scholar in any of this, is there an argument from the Jewish perspective that, and, and that you forced me to carry this, or is there an argument from um, another perspective that if I became incontinent because of a pregnancy that I wanted to terminate, that the state forced me to have a side effect from that pregnancy? Hmm. Are those... So the Jewish question is, is certainly one that's being pursued. Um, and there are cases, the case in Kentucky, right, that has been filed. Um, there was one in Florida, but it was the people who filed it in Florida are a little bit wacky, and I'm not sure how strong that case is. But I think the one that's being filed in Kentucky um, is more solid, and they ha they're partnering with um, agencies and organizations that do this kind of work. Um, uh, and you know, we'll see how far it goes. But you know, there are there are very clear Jewish laws that actually require abortion in circumstances where a woman's life is at risk. Um, and so um, I haven't haven't read all of what they're doing, I've just read about it in the paper, but um, I, you know, I think that that, that is certainly um, one strategy that's being pursued. Um, I, I, I have imagined the other, but I haven't heard of any cases. I mean, I think you would actually have to have that happen before someone could then sue. Yeah, that's right. I've, I've put this, um, I'm a medical professional and um, an oncologist, mm -hmm. and we recently had a patient who you cannot give chemotherapy until after 12 weeks. Um, and after that, it's safe to give. Um, but you also can't operate before, I think it's, you can't give anesthesia before eight weeks or something. So mm -hmm. there was a woman who came in with a wanted pregnancy mm -hmm. and um, had a very aggressive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was the conversation that we had to have. And, um, the life of the mother argument was in all of this, and thankfully she was less than 20 weeks. We had providers yeah, right. that were available. She was in North Carolina, but that was our recommendation: yeah. was we couldn't do a PET scan, we didn't know if she had metastatic disease. So I think that in that situation, we recommended an abortion, yeah. and she cried through her entire chemotherapy because sure. it wasn't one of pregnancy. But if we would have delayed another two months for chemotherapy, that would have been two months of a very aggressive cancer spreading. Yeah. And so I think that that was a very helpful, that's a very helpful when I'm talking to people, but then I, I think about that as well as something that doesn't come into this, again, I, I just feel like sometimes, I, I can visualize her, she was so young, mm. and I visualized her making this decision, and it felt like there were a million people in the room with us was she when Jewish? we were making the decision. She was not. Oh, okay. Um, but she was so happy to have this pregnancy that had gone far enough that she felt like maybe it could become viable. 
and I just, I think that that, I, I don't know what we would have done if we were in another state. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would we have been forced then to give chemotherapy that would have killed the baby? Or forced to do a surgery that would have killed the baby? Or made this woman not have treatment for breast cancer for another couple months? because the baby was more important than the cancer. Like, it's just a very complex decision that I think the conversation just becomes like, as you all work, that work in this space more often, we don't, and I, usually like cancer is like, okay, it's cancer, we're gonna make these decisions. Yeah. But it wasn't a religious decision, it was just a one-on-one -on -one decision. And um, I appreciate the work that you're doing that has small, I mean, that have pregnant, patients with breast cancer happen maybe once a year mm -hmm. um, and usually they're later term and it's no problem and they go on do fine but I do having that option available um, is such important work and I just wish that we would have had a lawmaker in the room with us to say what would you like us to do? how would you like us to make this decision because here's your crying patient Here's the sort of Damocles that's above her head. How would you like us to make this? This is what we're recommending. And you're taking all of these tools out of both of our hands. And it was a, it was a, it was very much a pause where I know some of my uh, probably more conservative colleagues even stopped and thought, this could be my daughter. This could, this is our patient. And thought, thank goodness this is available. Yeah. It was it was a very interesting. Um, and I think, I'm sure you guys see it more in the social aspect, but there are these other situations that hope, not hopefully, but hopefully maybe come up and start challenging this from the side, from a different perspective, like you're saying, to change the narrative into health, in complete right, women's that's healthcare. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I would just also say, I hear you saying that it would have been great to have a legislator there. You also can share that story with legislators, yeah. and that could be incredibly powerful, too. Yeah, we, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. Because yeah. people don't hear those stories. I mean, yeah. it's one of the reasons I'm doing this current research project, trying yeah. to collect the stories, story because yeah. what I, the, the number of people that I talk to just sort of in the public who who have all these stereotypes about who has abortions, like, you know, all these, it's just all the stuff. And, and, and the assumptions behind the, the legal rulings are that women are doing it casually, that they're not thinking about it, that they need these scripts to tell them that there are other positions that they haven't thought of. All of that is made up. Like, that's just invented out of, you know, stereotypes about who has abortions. Those scripts don't change people's minds. Like there are statistics around it and those they do not affect people's decision to have an abortion. They because it's not a decision that people arrive at lightly in most circumstances. Like even people who think you should have abortion access on demand and should don't need one of like a tragic reason to have abortion nonetheless still have to, you know, really sit with their decision to have an abortion, like just because, like if I made the choice to have an abortion just because I don't want to have a baby, that's still a choice that I've had to deeply consider at, at there's almost, almost never, I won't say never because never say never, almost never does somebody pursue an abortion without having seriously considered and arrived at that decision, um, like, understanding the gravity of it. So getting that counseling doesn't change things. Well, it's not counseling. Counseling? <laughs> well, and surely the point, I, I think that we have to admit at some point that the point of the pro-life movement was never to reduce abortions. Mm -hmm. That was never it. E even if I think some members of the pro-life movement consciously think it is, it's clear that it's not. It was there, if there was, there would have been a great coalition around various forms of contraception. The point of forcing pregnant women um, to look at sonograms, the point of imposing that bias counseling on them is to create shame and stigma and to reinforce the idea that women are not moral agents and should not be moral agents. 
and cannot be trusted. And that's the point. So you could show the effort and say, see, it's not working, the abortions still happen, but that's not, that's, that's fine. It is doing what it needs to be doing. We don't live in a world where we know that 25% of women access this form of health care in their reproductive lives. So it's a victory. I, I think in some ways the conversation over 40 has given way too much credit to the pro-life's own self-image, mm -hmm. which is directly contradictory and does not match their strategies or their positions. But somehow we've gone into this sort of taking them at face value. <laughs> yeah, how, I mean, I think I saw something about this in the nation. I mean, I think you, you, you can't untangle white supremacy from misogyny and patriarchy, right? They're like the trifecta of evil. and. Um, they're, the ways in which they're intertwined are all about, um, you know, elevating uh, or or retaining white positions of power in the culture, um, which includes white women having babies, which was the point you were making earlier, right? So that 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 it's not inconsequential that that Dobbs was passed after we've had some of the lowest birth rates in history in this country. Um, and the concerns that have been raised about um, those low birth rates, um, particularly among white women. Um, and so the, the, the racism that is embedded in both the explicit conversation around abortion, but also then um, simply the demographics of how um, abortion access plays out um, is, is, is absolutely all part of and, 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 and embedded in that culture of white supremacy. And we're also seeing sort of this increase in white nationalism, white Christian nationalism in particular. Um, so people have been asking me lately, so are the white Christian nationalists the same group as the white evangelical pro-life group? You know, I, and I talk about it as a, as a Venn diagram, right? There is definite overlap, but I don't think that they're exactly the same group. Um, although they both share many kinds of values around the white family, around white women, and elevating the role of mother, right? So there, there are these things that are, that are similar, but I don't think demographically they're exactly the same people. 